So share capital is a, is a very important term, and it's pretty simple. It's going to be the payment for the shares. So if we had 10 shares and they were worth $10 each, and they were purchased, and the purchase price was paid to the company, then the share capital would be $100. Okay. So the former rule was that if you were paying in $10, you didn't have to allocate all $10 to the share capital. You could name a part of that $10 and call that par value. And the reason why people would not want to allocate all of the payment to the capital is because once funds are called share capital, they can't be given back to the shareholders without a lot of protections because that is something which is deemed to exist to protect creditors, unsecured creditors. Okay, So the former rule with par value allowed a, a bit of fudging because the par value could be set very low and so then most of the funds could be paid back immediately to the shareholders and the company would be quite poor and it would be easy for the company to go bankrupt. Okay? So we have a statement of capital under Section 201 that has to be given to the company's registry every time the capital is altered. And if, as I said, the rule probably means that now when we pay in money to uh, receive a share, then the full purchase price of the share will be called share capital or the portion of share capital to that one share that you're buying. Multiply the payments times the total number of shares that have been sold and you have the total share capital. In the United States, just by comparison, you might want to know that the board sets the amount of capital depending on the needs of the company vis-a-vis -vis creditors. So if we were paying in 10 per share, the board might decide to set seven if that was a reasonable amount for keeping the company solvent and keeping a small cushion to be paid out as dividends in the future. And this has not been generally accepted in Hong Kong as a rule which would be seen as um, viable. So when shares are given out, that's called allotment. The shares are allotted to persons who then become shareholders, and the shareholders th then will register their name with the company secretary in the register of members, and at that point they become members of the company with all the rights that that entails. So when you're looking at allotment, there are issues that you should take as necessary to understand. Okay? So allotment is the act of issuing and selling shares, and then you always should look to understand the necessary approvals for allotment, the form that those approvals take, which would normally be a vote at a meeting of shareholders, whether the share should be offered first to existing shareholders, that's called a preemptive right. And that's designed to allow people to keep a certain fixed portion of the shares. So let's say we have this company with its 10 shares and you owned four of them. That's a fairly strong position in the company. Now, if the company decided to sell a thousand more shares to someone else, and that person had 1,000 shares, and now you have four versus 1,000, then you have gone from a dominant shareholder to insignificance by one allotment. But if we have preemption rights, then that means you have a right to purchase the portion 
of the new allotment that corresponds to your existing portion. So if the company has issued 10 shares and you have four of those, you have 40% of the company. Now the company issues 1,000 new shares, you would have a right to purchase 400 of that new allotment. And that would preserve you at the 40% mark within the company. That is a preemption right, and it's necessary to understand whether those exist or not. They do not exist automatically under Hong Kong law, but they can be brought in under the Articles of Association. Just by comparison, UK law does grant preemption rights to public companies. How payment should be made for the shares is different from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So Hong Kong is one of the most liberal jurisdictions you will see. What that means is that payment can be made basically in any form. Payment can be made by cash, by check, by a debt. I owe you the money for these shares and I will pay in the future. It can be made by a transfer of property. Here is a flat I'm giving to the company with a value of $10 million and uh, you give the company that in exchange for the shares. It can also be made, as we have in the practical uh, law application um, question, it can be made by the um, work of a director, which has value, and therefore can gradually pay for the shares. Instead of receiving a cash salary, the salary is paid into the company uh, notionally, and the company's credit versus the shareholder is eventually extinguished. So in Hong Kong, there is no particular restriction on how the shareholder pays for their shares. The next point is the percentage of payment that must be made. And again, in Hong Kong, there is no rule. So if you were to be given 100 shares of a company and all of the shareholders agreed, it could be that you will pay for those shares with your labor and that you will begin working for the company one month later. So there is no initial percentage necessary to receive the shares. It may be that you've agreed to pay cash, but you're only going to pay 1% of the purchase price at this time, and you will owe 99%. The percentage is not fixed, it is open. The assets that can be transferred to the company, the value that can be transferred to the company in exchange for the shares is also not fixed, it is open. When an allotment is made, it's necessary to declare the allotment and the names of the new members to the company's registry. This is part of the transparency function that the company's registry performs for all investors and creditors and other companies vis-a-vis -vis the companies incorporated in Hong Kong. So the authority required for allotment also can change from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. The general meeting must authorize any allotment of shares in Hong Kong, any allotment that raises new funds. This is different from, say, the United States law of Delaware, which is the most popular state law in the United States for company law, where the board of directors has the power to issue shares, which can put them in conflict with the members when they bring in a new shareholder that they like and the members do not. But in Hong Kong, as in all of Europe and the UK, it's necessary for the shareholders to approve by ordinary resolution the allotment 
of shares to a new shareholder. If rather than paying dividends at the end of a given year, the profits of the company were used to purchase new shares and those shares were given to all the existing shareholders in proportion to their holdings, like a dividend, except in the form of shares of stock. That is something that can be done by the directors because you see it doesn't disturb the existing shareholder power. And it is merely a payment which the members deserve and made by shares instead of by cash. For some reason, that's called bonus shares. It's not really a bonus because the members are giving up their dividend cash payments and receiving a share of stock instead, or more than one share of stock. A rights issue or a rights offering would be the same thing where options, the right to buy shares at a certain price, are given to the members in proportion to their existing holdings, and the members then may exercise those options in order to protect and preserve their holdings. So neither a rights offering nor a bonus share offering require shareholder approval. But when new funds are raised from new persons buying shares of stock in the company through a new allotment, then the members must approve that in advance by ordinary resolution. The advance approval could give the board some space to wait and watch with regard to price. So it would be possible for the uh, members to give the board up to one year to issue shares so they can wait and watch in order to issue the shares at the highest price and earn the most for the company. The last two points you've already seen in the uh, dealing between the company and third parties. So look at the last bullet point. You see that lack of authorization does not invalidate the allotment. That's very much like lack of authority of the company, uh, lack of um, power of the company to enter into a transaction does not invalidate the contract. Lack of authority of a director to sign the contract does not necessarily invalidate the contract unless the third party was well aware and were applying the Turkand rule, or lacking apparent authority. So we generally have in the law a protection of commercial dealing. The contract is struck, the contract remains. However, the person who extended their power beyond what was legally right can be punished. And that's the second and the last, last bullet point. So you see that the directors, if they violate the requirement that the members approve the allotment of shares, the directors are liable to fine and imprisonment if they violate the authorization requirement, which is quite severe, imprisonment in particular. So uh, the general rule is that allotment should be approved by the members unless no new cash is coming in from outside parties. That is, we have a share dividend, a bonus share, or we have uh, an issue of options or rights to the existing members. So I've explained this. When we, uh, when we issue shares to purchasers, we're going, we do not have preemptive rights, but, and anything can be used to pay for the shares. Uh, at common law, we had this notion of par value that I referred to before, and anything that was paid above par value was referred to as a premium. Today, the entire payment in Hong Kong will go into share capital, and generally speaking, the payments made for shares should not be lower than earlier 
members paid for the shares. So there should be some level of equality among the members. But the members can waive this through uh, the resolution approving allotment, and this rule does not mean that the price for a company's shares will always be the same. Obviously not. That changes for the economy. So generally speaking, there should be equity among the various members in terms of the price they pay. There is no set payment requirement. They don't have to pay in at the beginning any particular set, uh, any particular set percentage. And they can offer anything of value to the company in exchange for their shares. The last bullet point goes to a, a special circumstance. So if there was an IPO, a public offering of shares, what's necessary is that you have a way to distribute those shares to a large number of people. Now, if you produce um, yogurt and you package your yogurt and you want to sell that, you'll have to, uh, you'll have to pay something to Park and Shop, for example, to distribute that yogurt through its various grocers so more and more people can buy your yogurt. You'll lose some of the profit, but you will gain in volume. And that's the idea between the last bullet point. So the banks will distribute shares of stock along their distribution network to potential buyers, but they will expect to be paid. And so if the articles permit, a company can discount up to 10% of the price that a bank pays for the shares in order to uh, allow them to earn that 10% difference when they resell the shares for full price to outside investors. Now, the last in the, the initial list I gave you of items that you should understand when it comes to allotment, I said that you should understand the disclosure necessary. And the return on allotment is a standard disclosure which is made to the company's registry. So within one month after the sale of shares to the new investors, the allotment of shares, there has to be a statement of capital and the total number of shares together with the names and addresses of the allottees, any uh, state, any increase in the capital, the amount paid, and then the particulars of the contract uh, for non-cash assets or services contributed to the company. All of this has to be disclosed in a return on allotment, which will then be on file with the company's registry. And Hong Kong creates a lot of transparency regarding companies. Uh, you could go in right now, pick a company that you know, uh, look at the company's registry, search the company. Some levels of search can be done free of cost. And take a look at what the registry gives you. For a small fee, you can go deeper and receive their annual returns, their returns on allotment, and a lot of information about those companies. And that's available to anyone with internet access or anyone that goes to the company's registry and asks for inspection of documents.